Good morning, this is Miss Amy from Patterson Library. I am here for a week two story time with my Daring Dragons group. You are going into third and fourth grade. And today I'm gonna to talk about some mythical creatures. Guess what? We're going to talk about dragons and a little bit about fairies as well. But I'm going to start with a couple of jokes for you. Here's the first one. What does a dragon eat for a snack? Can you guess? This week is a hint. They like to eat firecrackers. You can tell that one to all your friends on the 4th of July. You can also tell it this way. What does a dragon like to eat with his soup? You guessed it, firecrackers. And the next one, and I really love this joke. What's the most stressful thing about being a dragon? Do you give up? Trying to blow out the candles on your birthday cake. Oh my gosh, I never thought about how hard that would be. Now we know that dragons are mythical, are fictional, that they aren't real. But I'll tell you, I found some books that almost makes me think that they are. These two books are in our nonfiction section, but they're in the folk and fairy tale and mythical animal section. And this one's called Dragons, Fearsome Monsters from Myth and Fiction. And the red book is called A Book of Dragons. And both of them describe different dragons through history and some of their characteristics and when they were thought to be around in fiction. This one's really cool. It even gives specific little facts. This page, St. George and the Dragon, talks about the dragon's head and tail and wings and body. It gives questions wondering if we know these things. Um, hundreds of years ago, dinosaur fossils were believed to be dragon bones. And there are different places in the world where these myths began about these different dragons. If you're into kind of creepy creatures, you might want to check out this book and we'll have it available for checkout at Patterson Library. Now, instead of reading a story today, I'm going to read bits of a few different stories. We have some great series here at Patterson Library that have dragons in them. So I'm just gonna read a few little paragraphs from three different books to get you started on some series that you might enjoy. Once you're in third or fourth grade, it's really fun to read series of books. You don't have to, but we have some great ones here at the library. This first series is the Dragon Slayers Academy. I'm going to read a little bit from the very first one so you get an idea of what it's about. These are written by Kate McMullen. Knock, knock. Who's there? Fergus bellowed from inside the hovel. A poor minstrel came a voice from the blizzard. A poor minstrel who? Fergus cried. Please, I'm freezing, cried the minstrel. This is no time for a joke. Pity, Fergus yelled. There's nothing I like better than a good knock, knock joke. He opened the door and there stood a snow-covered man with a lute and a pack slung over his shoulders. Icicles hung from his nose and his ears. His lips were blue from the cold. Be gone, Fergus shouted. There is no room here. Fergus spoke the truth. The whole hovel was but one cramped room, which he shared with his wife, Moina, and their 13 sons. 12 of the sons were big, beefy lads, just like their father. They scowled out the door. Be gone, be gone, they shouted. But the third eldest son, Wigla, was different from his brothers. He was small for his age. He had hair the color of carrots, and he could not bear to see any creature suffer. When Fergus reached out to slam the door in the shivering minstrel's face, Wiglaf grabbed his arm. Wait, father, could not the minstrel sleep in the pigsty? Well, as things goes on, the minstrel did get to stay. And I'm gonna finish at the very end of the first chapter. While he stayed, he told Wiglaf tales of his grandfather, who was a dragon slayer. Then one spring morning, Wiglaf brought the pigs their slop and found the minstrel packing. Are you off for good? Wiglaf asked sadly. Aye, lad, a minstrel must wander. And he said, I must eat something besides cabbage soup. But here, give me your hand. 
Before I go, I shall tell your fortune. Wiglaf held out his palm. The minstrel studied it for a long time. What do you see, Wiglaf asked. Something I never thought I'd see, the minstrel replied. The lines on your palm say that you were born to be a mighty hero. Me, Wiglaf cried, are you sure? The minstrel nodded. In all my years of telling fortunes, I've never been wrong. Imagine, Wiglaf explained, but what brave deed will I do? That, said the minstrel, you must discover for yourself. Now I must be off. I shall miss you, Wiglaf. And then the rest of the series talks about the adventures of Wiglaf. And as you know, since it's Dragon Slayer's Academy, his heroism must have, must have something to do with dragons. Now the next series that you might like is written by Kate Climo. These are the Dragon Keeper series. And I'm gonna again share a little bit from the first one in the series. Then there's a whole group of them here at the library that you might want to enjoy. Sometimes when you get a book in a series here at the library, you might notice that one is missing or it's checked out to someone else. We can try to get those on the inner loan system for you. So always ask if you're trying to read a series right through. Chapter one of The Dragon in the Sock door, Drawer is called Thunder Egg. On the first day of summer, Jesse, his cousin Daisy, and his Uncle Joe went to High Peaks. Uncle Joe had come to look for rocks. Jesse and Daisy had mostly come for the ride. Upon reaching the windy summit of High Peaks, Jesse took one look at the view and bent over to pick up a rock. I'm gonna skip a little bit. Jesse is staying with his cousin Dorothy. What kind is it, Jesse asked. I'm pretty sure it's a Prunella vulgaris, she said. It's totally magical. Its folks name is Self Heal. Cool. What does it heal, he asked. I'm going to skip ahead a little more because he kept the rock and he took it home. And he and his uncle and his cousin tried and tried to crack the rock open, thinking there would be beautiful crystals inside. I am sorry, I'm so grumpy, but it's so disappointing. I can't get this rock open. It makes me want to cry. Jesse went to his bedroom and opened his sock drawer. Sorry to put you through all that, he said to the thunder egg, placing it back in the drawer. The rock didn't say anything. Oh, I forgot to tell you that the rock spoke to Jesse earlier in the chapter. Jesse was beginning to wonder if it would ever speak again, but he was fond of the rock all the same. He went down to the kitchen and found Daisy already at work preparing their picnic lunch for the dough. She was making fresh lemonade. Her expression was fierce as she bore down on the electric juicer. Suddenly, shh, quiet. I was about to say, gee, I was just trying to whistle. But then he heard it too, a rattling sound, very faint, but very distinct. Jesse and Daisy stared at each other, mouths open. Jesse's eyes went to the ceiling. The sound grew louder. It was coming from upstairs. The cousins headed for the stairs, and by the time they reached the foot of the staircase, the rattling had turned into rumbling. It shook the family photographs on the wall. From there, where they were standing, Jesse could tell the noise was coming from the front of the house. In fact, it was coming from his bedroom. They started up the stairs, gripping the vibrating railing. The sound was thunderous now. At the top of the stairs, they turned to see that the doorknob of Jesse's room was jiggling. That's when the look of Daisy's face switched from excitement to fear. Jesse bravely crept open and put his hand on the doorknob, but he pulled it back. It's hot, he shouted over the din. Now he was scared too. If the house blew up, it would be his fault. This is ridiculous, said Daisy, squaring her shoulders. She went to the laundry cupboard, took out a washcloth. She wrapped it around the doorknob and turned it. The knob clicked, then kablam, whoosh! The bedroom door blew outward, knocking both cousins onto their backsides. The air was filled with green and gold dust and the powerful smell of hot chili peppers. Jesse and Daisy scrambled to their feet and ran into the room, coughing and waving away the dust. The sock drawer was on the floor. Socks were everywhere, and pieces of beautiful green and gold crystals sparkled among them. And in the middle of everything, something that looked like a lizard was standing on its hind legs and peering around. It was no bigger than a newborn kitten. Its bottom half was stout and covered with scales. They were green or blue, depending on how you moved your head, with a rainbow sheen of oil on a puddle. Sprouting from its shoulder blades were two dark bumps, not so much wings as the idea of wings. 
Two long dark green ridges ran down its back and along its pointed tail. Its head looked like a seahorse's, only broader. Jesse knew very well what he was looking at, but he didn't want to say it. So instead he said, whoa. Of course, you know what it is. And you'll have to read the books to find out all the adventures, starting with the dragon in the sock drawer. Now, the last series I want to tell you about is one that many of you know. The How to Train Your Dragon is a fun series, and it's also a TV show. So I'm going to read just a tiny bit. We have several of those here at the library. From How to Speak Dragonese. The Boarding an Enemy Less Ship Lesson. Once upon a foggy day, in a cold, cold country, long, long ago, seven small Viking boats floated through the sea known as Woden's Bathtub. The fog had swallowed up the peaceable country to the north and the Isle of Burke to the west, and indeed it swallowed up so much of everything that it was as if the boats were sky boats and had left the earth entirely and were sailing through cloud banks way, way up in the air. In the first boat, the fat boar, sat Gobber the Belch, a six and a half foot giant in teeny weeny hairy shorts who had leg muscles so enormous that they had muscles of their own and a beard like a hedgehog struck by lightning. Gobber was the teacher in charge of the pirate training program on the Isle of Burke and this sail through the fog was part of the boarding an enemy ship lesson. The six boy-sized boats that were following the fat boar each had two boys in them and these boys were Gobble's pupils, young members of the tribe of the Hairy Hooligans. Now you may know that Hiccup, horrendous Haddock III, was one of the boys in one of the boats. He sailed with his friend and his dragon, Toothless, whom he kept in his shirt sometimes. Well, that dragon was at least half the size of the other boys' dragons. And as you can imagine, that really wasn't something to boast about. Gobber shouting woke the little dragon up. He poked his nose out of his, the neck of Hiccup's tunic. Well, what's happening? He asked sleepily in Dragonese. Oh, nothing unusual, Hiccup whispered back, scratching toothless behind the horns. Goober is shouting, snot loud is showing off. We're all out here floating in the fog and the cold when we should be tucked up in front of a roasting fire. You can go back to sleep if you like. Oh, Toothless chuckled, you the Vikings are all as mad as mackerel. Wake Toothless up when it's little lunchtime. Now you may know from the series and from reading some of these books that only Hiccup can speak Dragonese and talk with Toothless. So again, this is a great series that you'll be able to read more about. Now before I finish today, I also wanted to show you one fairy book and then I'm gonna show you how to make a dragon's egg at home. I'm not gonna read this one today, but if you like fairies as well as dragons, this is a great book that we have here at the library that'll show you how to make fairy houses. Doesn't really take a book. You can use your imagination. But at the end of this book, where a child finds fairy houses out in the woods, I'll come back over the other side. There are some ideas at the back showing you different fairy houses that you can make. Now fairy houses are often made from all natural materials outside. You just find a little spot in the woods where you can use some branches or sticks or stones to make a little fairy house. I've done a separate video to make fairy houses, so you can look for the link for that on our webpage and on Facebook, and it will give you some ideas if you wanna make a fairy house using some indoor things, and I use some outdoor things with mine as well. So I hope you'll enjoy fairy houses because I just love thinking about fairies and elves and dragons and all sorts of fantastical little animals. Now before I go today, I wanted to just share with you a quick way to make a dragon egg. Here at Patterson Library, we had some old Easter eggs up in the loft. So I brought a couple of those down. And the other day when I was here, I took my glue gun Unfortunately, I have one that's not real, real hot, so it was a little easier to do. They have low temperature glue guns, but if you have a glue gun at home, you can do it with either. And I took the glue gun and just squirted glue all over my Easter egg. 
Now, if you don't have an Easter egg, you could use a lump of clay. You could cover a rock or an egg like this with clay or Play-Doh. You could even just crumple up some aluminum foil to make a dragon egg. Then you can, by adding glue all over it, it makes lots of nice bumps and crevices. I bet you can see that pretty well. I did this yesterday and it's still not completely dry. And then I painted it with acrylic paints. You could use tempera paint or watercolors if you wanted to also. And then today, oh, and when I was painting it, I happened to find some bubble wrap just laying around. So I actually just put the green paint on the bubble wrap and smooshed it on. Because I had already made dips with the glue, it didn't make a lot of difference, but it gave it kind of a cool effect. Then I'm gonna take some pink because, I don't know, I think dragon eggs might be pink and green. And I'm just gonna dab some pink here and there on my dragon egg. Not quite as much, I don't want it to cover up all the green. But whatever you'd like to do with yours, you can add many colors if you'd like, or just one color. And then if you have sequins or stickers or buttons, after it dries, you could glue on some other decorations. Because after all, since they're fantastical and mythical, a dragon egg can look however way you would like it to look. So I hope you can make some great dragon eggs. Also on one of the missions for the um, Read Squared program, there are some dragon eggs idea a little different from this one, and also a um, directions to make a picture of a paper towel dragon that you might wanna make. If you have your family or if you Google um, dragon crafts, there are lots of fun things out there that you might find to do. So that's all for this week. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.